welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm Liz Sulkin, and I would like to welcome you all to the Sustainability Laboratories Conversation Series. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. Tonight, it is my great privilege to introduce you to Brian Swim. Uh, Brian is the director of the Third Story at Human Energy, a nonprofit public benefit organization, and professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program. Swim did his doctoral work in gravitational dynamics in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Oregon. His newest book is Cosmogenesis, the story of his transformation from modern to noospheric consciousness. His media work includes the video series, The Story of the Noosphere, written with Monica Durast Bowles and the Emmy award-winning Journey of the Universe film, written with Mary Evelyn Tucker. Now I'm going to turn things over to the founding director of the Sustainability Laboratory, Dr. Michael Benelli. Hi, Michael. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Brian, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's really an honor to have you, and I already told you that it's been a great pleasure to read some of your writings and learn about your work in preparation for this session. I would like to explore with you the topic of cosmogenesis, new insights into evolutionary cosmology, and how a new perspective on reality can inspire effort to bring about a better world. So uh, let, let's start with a brief personal introduction. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Let's go beyond your formal bio to emphasize a more personal perspective, the making of uh, Brian Swim. But growing up, what made you choose your field, major milestone in your personal journey, uh, key shaping events, important mentors, inspiration, and the like. Please go. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Great to be here. You know, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, I, and it's, it's almost always raining. So actually, it's, it's, it's rare to see the stars. I mean, I, I, I think that was one of the big uh, experiences was just seeing the night sky and being amazed by it. And uh, I think it was Immanuel Kant who, who talked about how that if we, if we only saw the stars one night a year, we would just be perpetually amazed. It was like that for me. So, um, and then the other thing, this is odd, but uh, I, I would go to church every Sunday and, uh, you know, enjoyed the homilies. And then as I was like, in later late grade school, I, I had these fantasies of um, of giving those kinds of talks. I mean, just you know, expressing the nature of ultimate reality. I think it just appealed to me uh, from a very young young age. But um, one of the one of the decisive events in my own development uh, came when I was a, a young professor. Uh, of mathematics at uh, the University of Puget Sound. Uh, I write about this in Cosmogenesis, but it was, it was just I had this, this moment of of, of realization. I, I'm like like all humans, uh, one time or another, we wonder about the meaning of our lives, and and so I was wondering about the meaning of my life as a professor, and the um, the. The downside was um, I didn't know exactly why I was teaching these undergraduates all of this science, because I, I was becoming aware of the destruction taking place, carried out by, by you know, corporate humanity, all of us in, the, in these, these major companies, and I... I I, I just didn't have a sense of a deeper meaning. And so I, I really had to, I left, I left my position uh, really on, on a search to find out what, well, why are we here and what are we about? I, clearly we're about something more important than destruction. And that's where I met uh, Thomas Berry. 
and his um, his impact on me was immense. And he, what he his basic uh, insight for me was that we we humans find ourselves in between stories, and that's a dangerous place to be, because every culture needs a story to move forward. Um, we're 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 vulnerable if we don't have a a beautiful convincing story and he he really set me on that path of of thinking about that for the rest of my life and here we are yeah <laughs> still thinking about it well that's a, a good place to start with thomas berry i mean he obviously has been credited with advocating a new cosmological story and what was the essence behind the idea I, I agree with you that this is a, so important to have a coherent story. I think that's what we learned from Joseph Campbell and the whole history of mythology from around the world. So what was the, the, the key, the essence of his argument? I, his, the, the, the fundamental difference uh, between the, the new story that's emerging and the, the more traditional stories that Joseph Campbell uh, studied um, was the notion of a universe that is coming into existence as opposed to a universe that is was set in place and by a divine creator or or maybe the heroes of the past. But the idea of, in traditional cosmology is that the universe is set. And then what is happening, is excuse me is the human drama and thomas thomas perry was saying no it's it's not that everything in the universe is evolving and we 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 don't really understand how to live inside this kind of universe so that's why it requires so much attention on our part it's a universe that is that is not yet so it's it's impossible to to know the future because the universe is constantly transcending where it has been in the past. So that was the great the great insight from from Thomas. But another another way he thought about it was that because we have a common origin, that means all of us, on some deep level are related genetically. And by genetically, he meant both the DNA for life, but also genetically as coming, as having the same genesis. So the rocks that are that are in our life have been, they're part of a 14 billion year evolutionary process. Everything that exists is part of this process. And he, he liked to think of this as being our recognition that at a fundamental level, we are cousins to everything. It, it was one of the impactful insights I got from him. It's actually interesting uh, as it relates to the Buddhist concept of bodhisattva as someone who is aware and, and not just aware, conscious, aware, but also takes care of all sentient beings. So I, I think yeah. it resonates a little bit with that uh, with that notion, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that it's that it's the sense of <clears throat> comprehensive compassion, and and for for Thomas Berry, compassion had to do with with all entities. I mean, even to have a, a mountain destroyed, you know, in order to get at oil, that that to him was a sacrilege. <laughs> that he had deep respect for all of the entities uh, in existence, not just the humans and not just the living ones. So since we are about cosmology, what, what is the current view about main eras in the cosmic evolution? What are the major steps that one can discern as yeah. important milestones? These would be the fundamental uh, insights that that give us a universe that's qualitatively different from the traditional cosmologies. And in simple, I mean, just in, we can summarize the whole thing 
very simply, the the universe begins with a, a plasma of elementary particles. It develops into galaxies and stars. Inside of the galaxies and around the stars are the planets, in particular the, the rocky planets that give birth to life. And then we have the, the human emerging with, again, these major steps, the, the Paleolithic, the hunter-gatherers, and the Neolithic villages, classical civilizations, and their own in our own modern time. So this whole sequence uh, has been discovered using the empirical methods of science. And it 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 amounts to a a revelation that is as fundamental as the world religions. It's not a religion, but it but it's, it tells us something about ultimate reality that we simply didn't know before. So he regarded, Thomas Berry regarded the modern discovery of the time developmental universe as the primary revelation of our time. Well, it sounds like really a story of an awesome miracle getting from simple hydrogen to suddenly consciousness as we know it, at least. Yeah, that, that, and I like to dwell on that because it, I, I think that's the one thing that, that we can't lose sight of, is that uh, it is, a miracle, of course, has a certain meaning, but it's, it is certainly miraculous in that it, it stuns the mind when we really take in uh, what is happening, what is happening. And let me, let me just um, say one more thing. This long evolutionary process, 14 billion years, and then we come to Homo sapiens, perhaps 200,000 years. The Homo sapiens, and I give you the, the, the Paleolithic, the Neolithic, and so forth, but we live in the moment when we are constructing a new entity, the noosphere. The noosphere is that is 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 pointing at the idea of a new kind of organism, sometimes called the superorganism. We don't know what to call it. The word noosphere was was invented exactly 100 years ago today, or not today, but this year, exactly 100 years ago by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, uh, the French Jesuit and paleontologist. But he was, he was the first really to see and identify the emergence of, of a noosphere, which can also be called a planetary mind. So that, that too, is, is part of the news of our time. Uh, so you know that that begs the question: How how would you characterize the kind of the, the entrenched features of the classical models? You you kind of hinted at it, but perhaps you can elaborate a little more. Yeah. It, so the one thing I mentioned was that the, the classical view is that the universe is just set; the structures of the universe are permanent and set, and the human is changing. But in that, so the static cosmos, as opposed to the dynamic cosmogenesis, that's the distinction that Thomas made. But, but another, another really important difference I, from, I would say now, the, not from traditional cosmology, but from the scientific cosmology of most of the modern era, the, the sciences gave us a, a, a view of the universe that was alien, cold, without meaning, without direction. I mean, this all of this was was captured by the French existentialists that, it, it, that we just it was like their me, their message was to grow up. We live in a meaningless universe. Make your own meaning, you know, and so that, that separation, once again, between the human realm and this alien universe uh, is what drove 
what still drives a lot of the destruction taking place on the planet. So it's so important to take it in. And I, the, um, so as opposed to that view that the universe is dead, meaningless, what we have discovered just in the 20th century, just recently, at the end, really, of the modern period, we've discovered that the universe is expanding at just the rate that would lead to life and mind. I mean, this is a, we call it a revelation. This is something of such fundamental importance. It, it requires energy and, and effort on our part to bring it into our daily life. What does it mean to live in a universe that's expanding at just the rate that would lead to us? I mean, we don't know exactly, but um, one of the things that we one of the things we can think of is that we we are being carried by these powers in the universe. I mean, instead of talking about gravitation, we can talk about the curvature of space time uh, that, uh, from Albert Einstein's theory. But it's things are so are unfolding in such a beautiful way, including violence, but in such an overall beautiful way that we can, in like psychologically, uh, release ourselves and, and into the feeling of actually being embraced by the universe. Now, I, I know uh, scientists, if they heard that, listening to that, they'd say, what are you talking about? Embraced by the universe. That's you're, you're committing the sin of anthropomorphism. And so that, and that, that they're, they're saying, I'm, I'm projecting this idea of kindness and warmth onto the universe. Well, my answer to that is that they are subjecting the universe to mechanomorphism. So the, the embedded idea that the universe is like a machine, and that is projected out onto the universe. So no, we're at a radical change. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in a universe that is that is profoundly intimate with the emergence of life from the beginning. I think that, that's a fantastic way to, to emphasize about the living quality and meaning rather than mechanical kind of a, 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 an image or mechanical model. Uh, and and of course the so the reductionist way uh, that that really uh, forces us to think systems and even more yeah. now living systems, uh, meaning systems, and certainly not something that is out there which is entirely irrelevant to uh, our day to day affair. This is something that for most people will still be very difficult to. I think uh, to internalize that that this is important for what you do every day. Yes, and that that difficulty um, it, it can't be ignored or jumped over. It, we uh, we live in a time of, of vast destruction, and it, what it requires is a fundamental transformation of moving into the actual nature of the universe, living that way. Um, I don't have the answers, but it, I think all together we will find our way forward. It is, it's a radical change. So, you know, getting back to cosmogenesis, uh, since this is the, the main topic here, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about the, the, the whole thing about the new cosmological story? Can you highlight some of the really the, the the key concept and the implications take your time now and kind of deliver a little a little presentation on 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 that just sure. deepening the idea and making it more familiar to the people who are joining us tonight yeah there i would say let's begin with the um let's begin with the beginning and what we what we've discovered is you know, 13.8 billion years ago, there was this, um, this intense uh, burst of elementary particles. And uh, 
what is what is really amazing is that from the beginning, from the very beginning, the universe was aiming at things. Now, this is a yet another hmm. um, concept which 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 is opposed to the mechanical view of the universe we got from early modern science, the idea of intentionality. So what what is what do I mean when I say the early universe was aiming for something? I mean simply this, that if when we examine the nature of the physical interactions at the beginning of time, I'm talking now about the strong nuclear interaction, the weak nuclear interaction, the electromagnetic interaction, gravitational interaction. When we examine these and their relationships, their form, it, it was clear from the beginning that we were going to have planets and stars. <laughs> so it's just, now I'm not saying that there was, the early universe was thinking I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying that the the movement of the of the the energy, the dynamism, was in the direction of planets and stars and galaxies. I mean, maybe more than that. But I'm trying to stay just with, with what is absolutely certain from the point of view of physics. So that is that's a that again is a major change in how we think about. Our universe, because if <clears throat> if it knew what it was doing at the beginning of time, and at other moments we could talk about, maybe it knows what it's doing now. Now, when I say knows, I, I may have to put quotes around it. It's another kind of knowing, but you see, already there's a different feel when we we when we go beyond that dualism and realize. We're part of a system that is intelligent, not the way a human is intelligent. It's another kind of intelligence. So I think that's a huge, huge change in cosmology. The, the second one I, I'd like to dwell on <clears throat> is the change in our understanding of time. Now, we have, you know, we have uh, earlier, we lived in organic time. So they had the seasons, and you know, every during the year there are certain things that were appropriate and needed, and so that that organic sense of time um, was largely replaced by a mechanical sense of time uh, using the machine of the watch, and 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 that great things took place with that, but now we have. Another way of understanding time, I, I call it simply cosmological time. And what, is it, what does it mean to say cosmological time? It means the universe knows what it is about and enters into a specific kind of creativity at a certain moment. For example, big example. Around uh, 13 billion years ago, the first galaxies started to take shape. The, the first, and just imagine this moment. You have, you have the hydrogen and helium throughout the whole universe. Perhaps some st a few stars are coming in, but now galaxies begin to form. Now, what is, what's, here's what's amazing. Before that moment, it was impossible to construct a galaxy. The density of matter was too great. After that moment, the density of matter was too low to create a galaxy. We haven't had another galaxy created since that moment. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, just this is one of those moments. If, if we can take this in, we take a step into what I call noospheric consciousness. So here it is. Let's all take it together. I get this. Scientists have been, dis have been analyzing galaxies for 100 years, and we've learned tremendous things. 
but we don't really know yet how they evolved. They're that complex. So what, who is intelligent here? The human <laughs> that can't figure out how the galaxy is formed or the universe that created them. Now, created them so at the right moment, a trillion galaxies came fluttering into existence like snowflakes. That is the time of the galaxy creation. Now, we have another one that we all know about, and it's the time of the creation of life. Just the same. Life couldn't have come before on planet Earth because the, the molecules hadn't reached that level of complexity. But after life emerged, it couldn't emerge again because life ate up mm. the very molecules that enabled it to come forth. So, I mean, this thing about time, uh, the, the, in a real sense, uh, just, <laughs> just imagine trying to uh, organize matter into the form of galaxy. I mean, honestly, I mean, lifting a ton of, of matter, I couldn't do that. Uh, but just, just, just imagine how much was required to do that. But it was done, from our point of view, effortlessly. So it's this, likewise with life. God, we'd be, we'd be in laboratories for the million years trying to put together that, that complexity. Maybe we will someday, but it just happened effortlessly with early Earth. So this question, what time is it? From a cosmological point of view, is, is so vital. Because if we can identify the nature of this moment, then we have the opportunity to participate with this creative power that is capable of bringing forth so much. So what, now what, what Pierre Teilhard de Chardin thought was we live in the time when Earth is constructing its nervous system. Earth is constructing its planetary mind, which is a unified humanity. The, the planetary mind, the planetary nervous system, is what the human collective is bringing forth to create a thinking earth. So this, this is, the I think, the most important insight that I, I have concerning the nature of time. Uh, I could say more, but maybe in, in view of mechanical time, we should move on. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that the, the, the beautiful thing about this message is that we are dealing with processes that are essentially creative. The universe is creative, and therefore we can speculate about the role of human creativity as part and parcel of this process. Yes, exactly. So what, what for instance... What is the nature of our creativity, and and why are we here? That is, is that is that what you mean, Michael? Yeah, I think that's actually would be. Uh, we talked about uh, galaxies and the cosmos and all of this. Let's turn to us humans, yeah. uh, humans in universe. Yeah. Uh, what does cosmogenesis say about us? Who are we? Yeah. Why are we here in the first place? Exactly, and there, and then that the, that question is is the question uh, we need to ask if we are to enter into the creativity of this time, of this time. Who are we? And there, where there would be a number of number of ways to approach this deep mystery. One of them is is to say this: the one I'd like to reflect on. The human being is the space in which the, the universe as a whole reflects upon itself. So that, that the nature of the human, that we can say, well, the human is, um, is, is an economic animal. The human is a political animal. You know, the, the human is a religious animal, all of this. But 
it's also it's also the case that we are a cosmological entity. Just to say it again, we exist so that the universe can reflect upon itself in conscious self-awareness. Now, this um, this uh, this activity is has been carried out. Humans have devoted themselves to this task from the beginning. Uh, and always it's been a collective activity. I mean, individuals will think on their own, but even when they think on their own, they are using concepts, they're using words that have been invented by our ancestors. So it is we we you know in the united states of america we have developed very strongly the idea of individualism and it's it's powerful important individuals have rights and so forth but we need as well to to reflect on the collective nature of humanity and it just to go through the day sometime and just watch yourself and see what you're thinking 99% at least of our thoughts each day have come from others. I mean, I really saw this when I I realized one day that I I was I thought differently as an adult because of the science I had learned. I I, I was I was really integrating Einstein's thinking into my way of life. I, I I was just going about my day, but I was doing it differently than when I was a child because of this, this integration of, of previous knowledge. But all of us are like that. We, we, we take advantage of the fact that we're born with an individual brain, for sure. But in our culture, there is a 300,000-year-old mind at work. We have been accumulating knowledge for 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 years. So, so the example I, I, I want to uh, talk about with you uh, is it's such a great illustration of this, the nature of humanity in its quest to know reality. This um, is the James Webb Space Telescope just mm. launched? Just launched, but just just to take a minute and reflect upon it. Uh, the the James Webb te Space Telescope was was constructed by hundreds, thousands of engineers that came from fourteen different countries. Now all of them um, came together. It was like there's the collective mind at work, and it, they, they, but they weren't just using their ideas. That one of the most fundamental ideas for the construction of the James Webb Space Telescope came from Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. In uh, 1687, he gave the equations for the universal law of gravitation. Now, that. That law was contemplated, was analyzed by scientists. And a hundred years later, a scientist came up with an amazing fact that in Newton's equations for gravity, if we look at the gravitational system of the sun, earth, and moon, there were five places where gravity canceled out. So these, these points of stability who would who would even imagine they existed? But but because of Newton and because of Lagrange, that we so one of them, L2, is a point a million miles away from Earth. So if you draw a line from the sun to the earth and now keep going a million miles, that one place right there, things don't move. So we 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 learned that. Theory, and then we placed the James Webb te Telescope right there, and now that's it's drawing in 
data that otherwise we could never get. We are seeing, we're watching the formation of the first galaxies. I mean, can you take that in? The first galaxies are they're coming into existence and we are watching them. And I say we, I see. So the, the technicians of NASA, they send an electronic signal to the web and they, they get it to turn its eye in a different direction. And then it brings the data back. We interpret that. We're seeing the emergence of the first galaxies. So when I say we, I, who, mm. who was the we? Well, it's the technicians of NASA. It's the engineers who built it. It's all of us who are on the internet looking at the images. It's the huge contributions from humanity as a whole to construct this vehicle by which the universe becomes aware of itself in the conscious consciousness of humans. So, I mean, I mean, Michael, it just, I know I get kind of carried away here, but, but you just think, think of what, think, now, when we were paleolithic humans, we had the same brain size, the same anatomy, and, and they too wanted to know what's the nature of reality. And they came up with some ideas for sure, but compare that to what we know. So you see that the, this primordial desire to know has led to this enormous increase in knowledge. That is the noosphere in action. But let me just finish by saying, but to know is not the only primordial desire. We also have a desire to educate. We have a primordial desire to heal those who are suffering. And the, the, the collective humanity is building the equivalent of the James Webb Telescope for healing, for education. And we, we can try, but we can't even imagine what it's going to be like. It would be the same as asking a Paleolithic human to imagine the James Webb Space Telescope. So th this is, I, I think that one of the greatest things about this new cosmology that's emerging is that it provides such hope for what the future could be if we can align ourselves with the creativity that's already happening in the universe. I think what's beautiful here is that emphasis on the we that kind of uh, that, that kind of suggests the the, the the reality of an intimate community, really, not only of humans but even beyond, and it's a a creative community uh, that is doing the the task of evolution, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's a creative collective. So um, if, you know when when you when you look at all of this and you look at the major what we like to uh, uh, to think of as sustainability the exist existential issues that we face on the planet today. So all of this really implies uh, that we are at some kind of a crossroad. And the the big question that I want to raise for a minute is what are the key prerequisites that are necessary for this evolutionary transformation to, to realize what Tilaud, what the Chardin was talking about and others. You know, of course. And don't, don't um, be afraid about the mechanical time here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I, um, I, I, there would be what are the pre the key prerequisites? Um, that's such a you know an enormous question. I I would and there there are certainly many. I would say many. Let me. I but I would like to just choose one um, that I know is fundamental, and that is <clears throat> the notion of dualism. We, we live, we have an assumption of dualism that is, that is built into us because 
of the culture. And when I say we, I'm, I guess I'm talking about modern industrial societies. Uh, we have this notion of dualism. Uh, I, I usually blame Descartes and Immanuel Kant and so forth, but I mean, it's, it's happened. And uh, the, the main question is, how do we go beyond dualism? Well, <clears throat> one, um, one way is, is, is to just reflect upon what I was saying about Thomas Berry's contribution. And that is, we have a, we have a fundamental creation story, if you like. That when I say fundamental, I mean it, it's available to all cultures. It is, it's not something that is, uh, strictly speaking, uh, Western or Asian or South American. It is, it's been built up carefully, you know, over four centuries. And I, I think of it as, as the uh, the it's a it's a gift that comes from our generation uh, for the future, and so um, I remember when I was um, in grad school, and and you know there's we sit around talking, and you know this person is from Russia, this person is from Pakistan, this person is from Idaho, you know, but. We all agreed that you know the universe began with plasma and create stars and galaxies, and we all agreed. And and it, it slowly began to dawn on me uh, as the years went by <clears throat> that we are fundamentally all cosmological beings. I mean, I might be American, you know, you might be Russian, Chinese. And and those distinctions are important, you know. But underneath them, we we are all fourteen billion year creative events, and and to and to just to, to dwell in that that fact, and you know, to to dwell it when you have an encounter with any kind of person or plant. To dwell on the fact that we we both are living inside of the same energy, the same steps of creativity, I, that I find like at an intellectual level, dualism is not viable. But then the question becomes how how to make this <clears throat> how to live in this and feel it. Um, and I have I have a I have a little exercise I do. Um, it's just trivial in in a sense, but I, I think, I think we humans need to invent exercises, processes. I I'd call it even spiritual disciplines for moving beyond dualism. And mine is if I'm walking down the street, and um, I'll look ahead, and and I'll see some people, and I'll I'll imagine them breathing. You know, I can't see the air, but I just imagine it, and um, and I, I I notice that I think of I think of that air as being um, different from me, separate from me, and then I remind myself, in a in a few moments, I will be breathing in that same air, the same air, and it will enter into the processes of my body, and including. The, the flow of electricity in my mind, so that that air will be part of my thinking that it is not me. So it kind of wakes me up to the realization that, that, that and just even, even to observe another person, this is at another level, but even to observe another person is to observe who we are who we are, that the, this, this, the circular movement of it. Here's another one, though. I've, I've another exercise um, I do, and maybe it'll appeal to some people. Whenever I'm by a body of water, I live on the West Coast, so that, you know, the, there's the ocean, 
there's the San Francisco Bay, there's Puget Sound. But ever, whenever I'm by a body of water, I stop and for a moment and reflect on all the fish. I can't see them. Maybe one will flop out. But I just think about the fish and what they're doing, where they're going. And, and you know, maybe the, the marine mammals, because I can identify with them. They're mar- but the, especially the fish, I think about them. And I remind myself that the brain I have that is enabling me to think about them was stru- was given birth by the fish. The fish gave birth to these the f- early vertebrate brains, which were then evolved differently through the, the, the reptiles and the mammals. Nevertheless, I am a fish brain that has evolved to the point when it can reflect back upon itself. Well, I, you know I, that, that, that the whole uh, issue of dualism, uh, I, I think in a very simplistic way, you can say that most of the issues that we face today on the planet, all the adverse impacts of human activities, are, are really a result of that dualistic way of looking at reality that allows you to separate the me from the it, you know, here we are, and then there's something out there that that really uh, is not, you you miss the oneness and all this collective stuff that you're talking about. But remember, we are talking about what are the prerequisites, uh, and you talked about those two points. I think uh, one important and very difficult one, and I, I was wondering whether you can comment on that a little bit, is how to free humanity as a whole from all the relentless conditioning that has shaped a consciousness that is producing all the ills that we see around uh, through our own behavior and through the institutional behaviors, whether it's the corporations or the governments or whatever. So uh, the, that transformation, basically, it looks to me like we need to rethink everything. That most of the things that drive automatically our daily life, what we do, are, are things that emerged in the past. They are Neanderthal tools that just don't fit the reality anymore. No, they don't. <laughs> and we um, we find ourselves... Uh, you know, as we all know, in the midst of a mass extinction. So it's it's the worst moment in the last 65 million years in terms of uh, life's structures. And how, uh, so then, how do we, how do we proceed with this? How do we go beyond dualism in the midst of all of this? I, so I think, you know, Michael, what you just said is so so important that to an, an intellectual analysis that that shows the destruction is tied to dualism is is the first step. When we see that that the we live in a um, a fragmented and and difficult world, primarily because of this, the way we've been captured by dualism. So then the question becomes the next the next how do we step out of it? So I I, I can only tell you my own uh, thoughts on this. Uh, I know there are many many ways, but um, for me, uh, that's that's really why I left the University of Puget Sound. It it was because uh, basically. I was handing on technological powers uh, to entities, humans for sure, but also corporations that regarded Earth as something like a hardware store. That's finally what came to me. It is just this, it's, it's, it's resources. That's what the Earth is. It's resources. It, it's stuff that's there for our use. Humans then are, are here to use the earth any way we like. That was that was the, the unconscious cosmology I was living in, cosmology of, of, of the modern industrial era. So what what Michael, what I did is I, I used for and it's an ongoing process. 
I use the mass destruction of all these species, I use that as a way of examining my own ontological assumptions. And they are clearly dysfunctional, but <laughs> they're hard to give up because we identify with our assumptions about who we are, our identity. And so, but it takes, I think, we, we have the we have this massive extinction, as horrible as it is, it gives us the energy to deconstruct those those structures of existence in which we live. It just deconstructs those and enables the possibility of taking in a new foundation for our existence. I, I would love to hear what what you do, Michael, because I this is that your question is the question. Well, I do. Well, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I just struggle with those questions and try to understand deeper and better. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad, I'm not glad, but I, it, it looks to me that uh, even through this conversation series that we started a couple of years ago, my understanding of various aspects of reality have expanded tremendously. Uh, and it sharpened, helped, if you like, sharpened my view about the place of knowledge, the place of science, what we need to do and how. And I hope that that will uh, kind of feed into the work of the lab, of course, uh, yes, that is yeah. about transformation. Uh, but beyond that, I think that in, in much of what you're saying, uh, there is imply the need for a major kind of uh, epiphany for humanity as a whole. Uh, and that epiphany will have to go not only beyond the, the, the kind of uh, usual uh, conventional conditioning, but it has to be an inner experience and go beyond rational knowledge and scientific understanding, which is about words. How can you feel everything that you talked about today with great passion, how can you feel it inwardly and then express it automatically without thinking about it, really uh, becoming part of it without having to first separate and then decide how to act. But you know, I think uh, before we, we, we'll soon open this to some question for the, from the audience, which I'm sure there'll be a few, but to round all of this up, let, let's see if you can kind of summarize in a few words, uh, what can we learn from these 14 billion years of cosmic evolution in the sense of better organized human affair? What is the lesson there to how we should organize uh, humanity on the planet? Uh, how can we learn to live, think, and act in alignment with that cosmic creativity and community? Yeah, um, so in all the work you're doing uh, there at the lab in so many different ways is helping us move forward. And every one of them is crucial. I, I just have um, maybe one idea that might help, might help those that are, are involved with you on this issue of, of sustainability. And that is, it's just, uh, it's a way of, it's positioning sustainability in the context of cosmogenesis. So how does sustainability fit into the context of cosmogenesis? And on, on that point, I think it's clear. The, the universe, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, the universe aims at planets, the universe aims at stars, this can be summarized in a, in a phrase, the universe aims at building community. And just to tie it into Teilhard de Chardin one more time, uh, he called this the law of complex consciousness, so that the universe moves towards more complex communities, which exhibit a, a deeper and more intense consciousness. So there it is, that's Teilhard's cosmology in a phrase. Now, but the way I like to think about it is this. The universe goes to this enormous effort 
to build something like a galaxy or a planet. <clears throat> and then it, it, that enables it to take the next step so that the galaxy is, is fundamental for the creation of stars. A star is fundamental for the creation of a living planet. So these, these, these structures need to be maintained. So long as they are maintained, the, the rising of complexity and intimate community is almost effortless. So that has to be our fundamental aim, to, to protect the structures that, that have given birth to the most beautiful ecosystems that we know about in the entire universe, to protect those. The last image I want to leave you with is <clears throat> that of the spiral galaxy. A spiral galaxy, that structure of a spiral galaxy, is what enables a galaxy to create new stars. Uh, they can they can create new stars indefinitely, but when the gal the galactic structure is destroyed through collision or some reason, it is no longer possible for the galaxy that results an elliptical galaxy. It's not possible to build stars, be so that it it just it's it goes into a death um, flight one by one. The stars die out. So our our effort has to be to protect these amazing processes and structures that Earth has given rise to. That would be my way of, of positioning uh, your work inside of Cosmogenesis. Well, you know, the, the one way that I think about it sometimes is that you have, uh, you, if, you, if you have a, a, a system in general that is well adapted to an environment and suddenly the context change, it has to go through a major transformation in order to keep. And transformation usually, uh, uh, how should I say, ignite all kinds of inertia, yeah. things that try to keep things as, 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 as usual. And I think that this is how sometimes I, I interpret what I see in the world today, that the, the, the system is trying to evolve and it's blocked by all those mechanisms of yesterday. And that creates the kind of crisis that we see. And yeah. if that is a general evolutionary crisis, uh, we know that such conditions have been met in the past and transcended. Uh, and so this is another, uh, another what? Another word of hope, if you like. You talked about yeah. hope earlier. Yeah. And that's why yeah. I, I, that's where I get the energy to do what I'm doing. That's uh, in great. spite of all the <laughs> negative uh, inputs that you get in data that you get all the time. Really, this was a great session, Brian. I'm so glad you joined us and came here. It was lovely to meet you and to get to know you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Take care, everyone, and see you soon. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Bye, Brian. Talk soon. Bye-bye.